Good morning. Hi, I'm Megan with CIPD, and I'm here to read another story with you this week. Today we're going to be practicing reading a book called Ada Twist Scientist. And in this story, we're going to be determining the central message or theme. You may say, what is the central message or theme? Well, that's where we're going to be determining what lesson we learn from the story or what the author wants us to learn or take away from the book. So when I determine central message or theme of a story, I go through a process that you can actually do at home by yourself. So first, we're going to have to finish a common text, which is going to be our story, Ada Twist Scientist. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to create a list of topics that's in our story. After we've created a list of topics, we're going to pick one of those topics and we're going to write a sentence about what we think the author believes about that topic. And then last, we're going to cross off that author believes that and then we're going to revise our statement. And from there, we're going to have a theme or central message statement. So while I'm reading the story today, I want you to be thinking about what lesson does the author want me to learn from this book or what is the central message or theme and then be thinking about topics that appear throughout our story so that we can generate a really good list when we're done. Okay, let's get started reading. Ada Twist, Scientist by Andrea Betty, illustrated by David Roberts. Ada Marie, Ada Marie, said not a word till the day she turned three. She bounced in her crib and looked all around, observing the world, but not making a sound. She learned how to climb and made her big break with trails of chaos left in her wake. She ran through the day chasing each sound in sight and didn't slow down till she conked out at night. Her parents were frazzled, but tried not to freak, as Ada grew bigger and still did not speak. Clearly, young Ada, with lots in her head, would have something to say when it ought to be said. That's just what happened when Ada turned three. She tore through the house on a fact-finding spree and climbed up the clock just as high as she could. Her parents yelled, stop, as all good parents would. Ada's chin quivered, but she tried not to cry. She took a deep breath and simply asked, why? Why does it tick and why does it talk? Why don't we call it a granddaughter clock? Why are there pointy things stuck to a rose? Why are there hairs up inside of your nose? She started with why and then what, how and when. By bedtime, she came back to why once again. She drifted to sleep as her day's parents smiled at the curious thoughts of their curious child. She wanted to know what the world was about. They kiss, kissed her and whispered, you'll figure it out. Her parents kept up with their high-flying kid, whose questions and chaos both grew as she did. Why, what, how, when, why? Will it be the same what if? Why does it, how does it? Even Miss Greer found her hands were quite full when young Ada's chaos wreaked havoc at school. But this much was clear about Miss Ada Twist. She had all the traits of a great scientist. Ada was busy the first day of spring, testing the sounds that made mockingbirds sing when a horrible stench whacked her right in the nose, a pungent aroma that curled up her toes. Zowie, said Ada, which got her to thinking, what is the source of that terrible stinking? How does a nose know there's something to smell? And does it stink if there's no nose to tell? She rattled off questions and tapped on her chin. She started to start where she ought to begin. A mystery, a riddle, a puzzle, a quest. This was the moment that Ada loved best. Ada did research to learn all she could of smelling and smells, both the stinky and good. What hypothesis Ada thought could be true? The terrible stink came from dad's cabbage stew. She tested and tested, but soon Ada knew it was time to come up with hypothesis two. Then zowie, that stink stuck again. Just like that, hypothesis two 
It's caused by the cat. The cat couldn't make such a stink on its own. It needed perfume and some fancy cologne. So young Ada tested. The test was a flop. She started again, but her parents yelled, stop. Ada Marie, Ada Marie, to the thinking chair now. By the time we count three. Enough, said her mother. That's it, said her dad. Her parents were frustrated, frazzled, and mad. Why, Ada questioned. Her mother said no. What, Ada queried. Her father said go. You've ruined our supper. You've made the cat stink. Enough with your questions. Now sit there and think. She looked at her parents. Her heart turned to goo. Poor Ada Twist didn't know what to do. She sat there alone by herself in the hall, and Ada, once more, could say nothing at all. And so Ada sat, and she sat, and she sat and she thought about science and Stu and the cat and how her experiments made such a big mess. Does it have to be so? Is that part of success? Our mess is a problem. And while she was thinking, what was the source of that terrible stinking? Ada Marie did what scientists do. She asked a small question and then she asked two. And each of those led to her three questions more. And some of those questions resulted in four. As Ada got thinking, she really dug in. She scribbled her questions, tapped on her chin. She started at why, and then what, how, and when. At the end of the hall, she reached why once again. Her parents calmed down, and they came back to talk. They looked at the hallway and just had to gawk. No patch of bare paint could be seen on the wall. The thinking chair now was the great thinking hall. They watched their young daughter and sighed as they did. What would they do with this curious kid who wanted to know what the world was about? They smiled and whispered, we'll figure it out. And that's what they did because that's what you do when your kid has a passion and heart that is true. They remade their world, now they're all in the act of helping young Ada sort fiction from fact. She asks lots of questions, how could she resist? It's all in the heart of a young scientist. And as for that smell, what can Ada Twist do but learn all she can with her friends in grade two? Will they discover the stink that curls toes? Well, that is the question. And someday, who knows? The end. So, that was a great book. And now that we finished our text, we want to go back to determining our central message. So we finished step one, finish a common text. So that means that all of us finished that book. But again, if you finish that book, you can do this process too. So now we're on to step two where we want to create a list of topics. So that's where I'm going to model some of my thinking out loud. So as I'm sitting here and reading this story, some of the topics that kept coming up was that Ada was curious. Another topic that was present in our text was that she was very bold or brave in this process. She also was very imaginative because she was always thinking of questions to ask and she was curious and creative in that process. So after I've brainstormed a few topics, I want to narrow it down to just one. So I think I'm going to go with curious. Now, once I have my topics, I want to move on to my step three and write the sentence about what the author believes. So now I have my author believes that statement here already ready to go. So you can be writing this down too on a piece of paper at home. So the author believes that. Hmm. So what does the author believe about being curious, right? So at the end of the story, does Ada find the answer to her question? No, but she continues to be uh, curious in the process of what caused that smell. 
So she continues to ask questions and she doesn't let um, her asking of questions and why and when stifle her love of learning. And she still wants to be the scientist and learn the answers to so many things. So I think her curiosity actually helped her grow and change and even her parents, right? Because at the end you see that her parents learn to appreciate this curiosity and passion that Ada Twist has for learning. So I think I'm gonna craft my statement around that. So I think I'm gonna say the author believes that curiosity and passion. Hmm. So what does it believe what does she believe about curiosity and passion? That it helps you learn about yourself and maybe realize that asking questions isn't such a scary thing. So the author believes that curiosity and passion will help one learn and grow even when it's scary. So after I've crafted, my author believes that statement, I wanna cross off that first part. The author believes that. So I'm gonna go back to my statement and I am going to get rid of this part in the purple. And then what's left is my theme or my central message. And then you may need to revise it and tweak it to make sure that it sounds right when you read it back. So what I did is I rewrote it on a piece of paper so you, that you can see this nice and clear. So now my theme or central message statement would be, curiosity and passion can help us grow and change even when it is scary. And that would be the lesson that my author wanted me to take away or learn from this story. So now that I've determined how to pick a theme in a book, you can do this process with any book that you have at home or maybe that you're reading with your teachers in class. So I want you to go through this process of finding a common text, creating a list of topics, and then crafting the author believes statement for your book. And hopefully, some of the stories that you're reading this year, you'll become an expert at determining theme and central message with your classmates or even a partner or even someone in your family. I look forward to seeing you guys next week for our reading on Tuesday, and I hope you have a great day. Bye. Kindergarten is great at Kansas City Public Schools. I know this, they have really good teachers. Uh, I know this is a great school. They teach them stuff that I thought my kids would never be able to know at the age of five. Since deciding to send our kiddos to a neighborhood school, we've become a, even more of a part of our community. Now is the time to enroll your future kindergartner for the new school year. Visit enrollkc.org today. Good morning, welcome. So this is ELA for third through sixth grade and today we're gonna share the summer my father was 10. I'm Sherry Easton and we're ready to learn about character actions. So today, when we read the summer my father was 10, we're gonna think about the character, the father, who this is a story about when he was a little boy, when he was 10, right? And we're gonna think about the actions that the character makes, what he does, his dialogue, what he says, what he says to each of the other characters and what he and what he thinks in his head. What we're gonna look at really specifically today is how he interacts with other characters. So the main character is the father when he was a boy, and we're gonna look at where how he interacts with the other characters through his actions, words, and thinking. The Summer My Father Was Ten by Pat Brison. Every year, my father and I plant a garden. Tomatoes, peppers, onions, marigolds, and zanias grow in straight, neat rows. We pull the weeds that pop up and we water, mulch, and tend it all through the summer, cutting the flowers to make bouquets for the kitchen table or to give to Mr. Morosky, our neighbor, 
who broke her hip last winter and has to walk with a cane now. The flowers make her happy. And every spring, my father tells me about Mr. Bella Vista. And the summer, my father was 10. Mr. Bella Vista lived alone in the third floor apartment above my father and my grandmother. Plants all, grew all winter on his windowsill. And in the, sum, in the spring, he trudged with late. Ooh, hold on, I'm reading too fast. Do you ever do that, readers? I'm gonna slow down and read that part one more time. Plants grew all winter on his windowsill, and in the spring he trudged with rake, garden fork, and trowel to the vacant lot next door to plant a garden. That sounded better. Some years he had to drag away old tires, broken bottles, and other trash before he could even start the garden. Once his garden was planted, though, you could find him there early every morning, weeding and watering and watching over his plants. And in the evening, he would go and sit on an old wooden folding chair and listen to opera on his radio, right there amongst the plants. My father didn't know much about the old man, Mr. Bella Vista, only that he always wore flannel shirts buttoned up to his neck, winter or summer. He didn't talk much to other people who lived in the building, and when he did talk, his accent made his words sound kind of strange. My father and his friends made fun of him. They called him the old spaghetti man. That's really sad. Let's see what's gonna happen about that. Then one August afternoon, when my father was 10, he and his friends were playing baseball near Mr. Bella Vista's garden. My father's friend, Nikki, hit a ball over the, my father's head and it landed right in the middle of Mr. Bella Vista's garden. My father ran to get it and found it under a big leafy tomato plant. The tomatoes were round and red and ripe, just about the size of a baseball. And my father thought, boy, I'd like to see Nikki's face if I threw a tomato instead of the ball. And he hit it and it splattered all over him. Notice how we're talking about the actions, the thinking, and the dialogue that the character is taking. So here's the character of the boy, the, the father, right? And he's thinking, wouldn't it be great if I threw the tomato instead of the baseball? That's the action he's going to take. Probably not a best decision, but we'll see. And so that's what he did. And Nikki did hit it, and it got splattered just like my father thought he would. My father laughed and laughed, and Nikki chased him back into the garden and grabbed a tomato off the vine and threw it at my father. And then back and forth, then my father threw one at Nikki, and then Joe threw one at Kevin. Before long, they were all throwing tomatoes and peppers at each other or batting them against the side of the building, the hollow peppers thumping against the bricks and showering thin white seeds and pulp on the wall and ground and the tomatoes hitting with a splat and bursting into messy globs. They even pulled up onions and uprooted the flowers, swinging them around and around over their heads before letting them fly. I'm not, I'm not getting a good feeling about these actions that the character is taking. You got a little carried up. Do you ever get carried away in something that seemed like a good idea and then all of a sudden it becomes a big mess? Uh-oh. Look who's the characters going to interact with now. This is Mr. Bella Vista, right? And here's the characters. There he is. Let's find out what's going to happen. They were shouting and laughing so much that they never heard Mr. Bella Vista coming. But when Nikki stopped laughing and suddenly stood still, eyes wide and staring, my father turned around and saw his neighbor standing there. He was shaking his head and saying something in Italian, in a kind of sad voice. He looked at the wall splattered with tomatoes and peppers, and, it, and then he looked at my father and, my, and his friends, and he just said one word. Why? And we're stopping and thinking about how characters are interacting together, right? So how is the interaction now between the father, who's now a little boy, remember, and Mr. Bella Vista? Probably not a great interaction. Let's find out what's going to happen. Oh, you can see, look, even before reading, you can see that the father kind of probably feels bad about what he did. And Mr. Bella Vista is picking at fixing his garden. That's left a mess, right? My father looked at the garden, trampled and ruined, and it was only then that he realized what they had done. He looked back at Mr. Bella Vista, but the old man had gone to his plants and was tenderly picking up the broken pieces and setting them in a pile at his feet. My father's friends all went away, leaving my father and Mr. Bella Vista alone in the, in the garden lot. My father wanted to go over and tell his neighbor he was sorry, but his feet were like heavy stones holding him there. 
He watched for a few more minutes and then dragged himself home, unable to say anything to Mr. Bella Vista. Listen to that part right there, guys. That said, his feet were heavy, were like heavy stones planted there. That's kind of, you can imagine, see, you imagine the, the father feeling bad, the boy he's feeling bad, and he's almost like, he, I should go talk to Mr. Bella Vista, but I really don't want to, because I know I did something horrible, right? You ever feel that way? Where you know you should do something, you should go tell somebody you're sorry, but it's super hard to do. You can almost feel how bad he must feel, right? The next morning, the mess had been cleared away. The ground was raked smooth. There was no way to know that a garden had ever even been there. But my father knew it had been there. My father's friends seemed to forget all about what they had done, but my father couldn't forget. Every time he saw Mr. Bella Vista, he remembered and wanted to tell him he was sorry, but he, he just couldn't make the words come out. I can relate, can you relate? Think about the actions between the words, interactions between characters. Interaction is when one character says or does something that affects another character, right? Even by not saying things, even by not talking to Mr. Bella Vista, he's in having an interaction with Mr. Bella Vista. Because can you imagine that Mr. Bella Vista expects him to come say he's sorry, right? And then when you expect someone to say sorry and they don't, it's almost, almost worse than what they did, right? Fall and winter came. My father went to school, played with his friends, and almost forgot about what had happened. But when April came again, he remembered. He watched for signs of his neighbor getting his garden ready, but nothing happened. Then May came, and the sun was warmer, and the days were brighter, but still Mr. Bella Vista made no move to plant. Now here's a clear interaction. They're gonna, they're gonna be saying something to each other. We can sell by the pictures, right? This is gonna be a character interaction between these two characters. Finally, one day, when my father was going up the stairs on his way home from school, he met his neighbor going down. Mr. Bella Vista, my father began, are you gonna plant a garden this year? Mr. Villavista's eyes looked straight into my father's eyes. So you can destroy it again? He asked. Ooh. N no, my father stammered. I wouldn't do that. I mean, I'm sorry about last year and I thought maybe I could help you build a garden this year. Mr. Villavista didn't say anything at first. He studied my father for a few minutes, then rubbed his jaw with the back of his hand. Think about this action, right? Can you imagine what this character is thinking and feeling? He must be very nervous. First, he just had to go apologize, be brave enough to apologize, right? And offer to help. Now he has to wait for Mr. Bella Vista to say something back. So can you imagine how nervous he feels? And I would imagine that Mr. Bella Vista feels a little angry still. What do you think, right? But then, can you imagine that anger getting just a tiny bit better? when he hears the boy apologize. That's what we call a character interaction, a dialogue between two characters. Mr. Bella Vista says this, listen. Tomorrow, he said at last, tomorrow we'll make a garden. The next day was Saturday, and my father and the old man worked all day together. When they were finished, they had a patch of ground carefully raked and planted with tomato and pepper plants and teeny tiny onion plants and seeds for marigolds and zinnias. Now when my father looked at the garden, he didn't get a hard knot in his stomach anymore. Summer came, and every morning my father and Mr. Bella Vista checked the plants. My father carried water from his apartment down during the dry spells of summer, and he learned to tell what was a weed and what wasn't a weed. When the flowers bloomed, the old man gave my father bouquets to take to my grandmother and set at the dining room table. And when the tomatoes were red and ripe and a little bit bigger than baseballs, and the peppers and onions were ready, my father helped Mr. Bella Vista make spaghetti sauce. And then they all ate dinner together in Mr. Bella Vista's apartment and listened to opera on the radio. And my father found that he actually liked it. Every year after that, my father helped his neighbor in the garden until the spring when my father was 16 and Mr. Bella Vista got sick and went to live in the nursing home. And then my father planted the garden himself, and when the flowers bloomed, my father carried bouquets on the bus to his old friend. And when the tomatoes and peppers and onions were ready, he made spaghetti sauce and put some in the freezer and told Mr. Bella Vista they would have a spaghetti dinner when he came home. But Mr. Bella Vista never did come home. And now every year, my father and I plant a garden, tomatoes, peppers, onions, marigolds, and zinnias, 
in neat straight rows. And every year I hear the story of the summer my father was 10. That is how readers stop and think about how one character interacts with another character through the things they say, the things they think, and the things they do. So when you're reading, you want to stop and think, how are these characters interacting together? What are they saying and doing together? And how are they making each other feel? That's important. Readers, keep that in mind next time you're reading. And parents, when you're reading together with your student, you can ask them, how are these characters feeling? And how are they getting along together? How are they interacting together? Interaction is when one character and another say and do things together. So be thinking about that as you're reading. So that's ELA for today. Next time, we're going to do some more character thinking, only we're going to learn how to analyze characters. See you then. I love Southeast because of the culture, the band program, and restorative justice. I love Southeast because of the academics, sports, and students. I love Southeast because of the people, the energy, and the advanced classes. It's not a like. I love Southeast because the students here at Southeast are full of potential and they believe in achieving anything. We are, we are Southeast. Southeast. We stand. We shoulder to shoulder. Shoulder to shoulder. Join the Southeast family. Enroll today. Good morning, Kansas City, and welcome to another edition of KCPS Homeroom. I'm Chris Odom, your ELA coordinator for Kansas City Public Schools, and thanks for joining us this morning on this ELA Tuesday. Okay, today we're going to talk about poetry again, uh, featuring the work of Elizabeth Acevedo, like we did last week. Uh, instead, this time we're going to use her work to talk about setting. And you might find that you've talked about setting a lot throughout your years as a student, uh, but the older you get, the more you really see how much setting has to do uh, with more and more of the story and more and more of what you could decide uh, the author was trying to show you or represent in the text. So the setting can really be a, a really big additional piece to understanding um, the environment and the characters who live there, uh, work and breathe or, or do their thing there every day. Um, <clears throat> again, this is Elizabeth Acevedo, and I'm going to read out loud a really neat quote and when you start looking for her online you find that she's really thinking about her message to young people so she says I think young people especially need to read text that affirms what they feel is valid and that also pushes them towards an understanding of how others live and think and we've often heard um, that this is one reason that it's great to read a variety of literature and text because you get to learn a lot about different people and different backgrounds and experiences um, in a different way than you know just by searching online okay today we're going to talk about setting we're going to learn a little bit more about Elizabeth Acevedo we're going to hear five poems that I'm going to read of hers from her award-winning national uh, book award winner for the poet X and we're going to apply our definition of setting back to that book and the five poems I have selected we're also going to annotate some specific details and see if we can find some examples that helped us come to some conclusions. Okay, the setting, to define it a little bit, is the location in which a story takes place. And remember this location was selected by the author, so in some degree it might be that it helps us decide or understand um, the background of the characters and often the setting has quite a large influence on the people in stories, just like it would in our everyday lives. Um, the way we live, the way we are brought up, and the way that we experience daily life might have a lot to do with the setting, the place that this happens. And often we think about places, um, and you can get more and more specific when you start to zoom in a little bit uh, on the details that are in a place. When you go from like the country deeper into the uh, state and then you can go even further and deeper into the city 
And then you might even find that within city you could go into neighborhood. And then within neighborhood you could certainly go into different streets and different um, houses and housing areas, uh, housing developments, whether they be in the suburbs or, or, or different locations in the urban community. Uh, apartment complexes and so the further you zoom in these become specific defining elements of uh, the place and the people who may inhabit that place work there live there on, on a day to day um, so these are the brownstones in the uh, neighborhood that's really changing that this book is written and features in Harlem in New York and a lot of these places are becoming top dollar uh, and have been for some years but really really becoming more expensive uh, and something there that's happening in, throughout the country is, is called gentrification where it's almost too expensive for the people who originally grew up and lived there to afford to live there because of the redevelopment uh, and the modernization and then the new people who are moving in so if you didn't realize all that's part of a story or uh, a setting perhaps that's something to really realize as you get older okay so it's often the time and we might be thinking about the time of day has a factor on what we're doing, right? So a story told in nighttime is probably going to have um, a lot of different uh, variables to it. And a, and a story told not in nighttime, but like right in the middle of the morning, we all know we're doing different things at that time. So um, like right now, I'm losing my screen, but I got it back, right? So... The setting for us doing these kinds of lessons and teaching. Uh, I'm essentially here in my living room, which is tremendously different for uh, school to, to feel that way, right? So this is Elizabeth Acevedo. I like this picture. This is from when she was out performing, and I think she'll probably keep performing. I, I can only guess. Sometimes when you come from that performance background, you're not doing it just to make money in the beginning of it all. Um, so all of these uh, credentials she has to say about herself and only growing more and more with every day. Uh, she's also a really great representative that wants younger writers to find their way uh, to the podium, to find their way to the mic, to find their way into literature and write the history as we keep learning from an expanded audience and an expanded uh, authorship that is definitely necessary uh, when we talk about what it means to be a reader and a writer in the United States. Okay, so when you're talking about setting, this is Harlem, and I believe this is pretty recent Harlem, and the only way I'm going to guess is because of the blue on the basketball courts, kind of a telltale sign also that happened in tennis, um, and perhaps then that points to a certain time, but I could be absolutely wrong, right? That's all I have. The historical period... Uh, has a lot to do with setting when you're reading stories you know if it's not set right now then the author probably chose to feature a time in history that uh, again the setting was a large variable or something that uh, we went back to experience so we could see how it would change our thinking about the people who experienced that story okay the geography if you've traveled much uh, you know that when you go places the, often the the feel of being there, if you're surrounded by mountains and if you're near a water area, uh, that is the geography, the actual land, and it has a tremendous influence. A lot of times people go on vacations and are so amazed by the geography and the difference that they might want to live or move there. So uh, when I go toward the southwest, over toward like New Mexico and, and Taos and Arizona area, uh, it just feels like ancient times, and I, I love going there for that reason. I feel kind of connected to long, long ago. Okay, or the hour, the hour of the day, like we talked about time before. Um, at different hours, we could guess what hour of the day this is, and based on uh, the lighting and the fact that it's not dark, we're going to say sometime before dark, but we're not really too sure. I'm certainly not if it's morning, afternoon, um, but I would imagine, based on different times of day, then something else happens in, in this park. More or less people. Um, and so, you know, there's a, there's a variable there, right? What time of day is it? Okay, so we're going to apply it to a text and we're going to think about setting. Remember, all those things that you're going to be thinking about that we just went over of what setting might involve, 
could have to do with the history period. It could have to do with the time of day. It could have to do with the vibe and the feel of being involved in the place that the characters are. Um, so I'm going to preview a few questions that we're going to ask you to think about. And if you have found this book online or you want to look for it uh, yourself and, and have a copy at home, I will be using it a little bit more as we keep doing these lessons. So question one in our four to think about is, what is the setting like in the Poet X, in the poems I read today? Question two, which details help me decide what the setting is like? This is actually, again, uh, in Harlem. In Harlem, somewhere I got to visit last year, uh, so I could really kind of go with what I thought I was going to see, and then I learned by being there uh, some new things, because you really don't uh, really truly feel a setting from far away just by reading about it. Okay, and remember our character in this book's name is Ziomara Batista, so we're going to also wonder about how does Ziomara feel about being in this setting. Remember that setting has a large influence on the characters that are involved there. Okay, and then we're going to predict something. What influence will the setting have on the rest of the story to follow? And which details do you think today gave you some clues about that? Okay, so we're going to rewind here to this first question. And while I'm reading this first poem, we're going to ask you to consider just what is the setting like? Okay, I've marked some with my highlighted green pages here. Okay, this first poem is called Mommy Works. Mommy works, cleaning an office building in Queens, rides two trains in the early morning so she can arrive at the office by eight. She works at sweeping and mopping, emptying trash bins and being invisible. Her hands never stop moving, she says, her fingers rubbing the material of plastic gloves like the pages of her well-worn Bible. Mami rides the train in the afternoon, another hour and some change to get to Harlem. She says she spends her time reading verses, getting ready for the evening mass. And I know she ain't lying, but if it were me, I'd prop my head against the metal train wall, hold my purse tight in my lap, close my eyes against the rocking, and try my best to dream. Mm. Wow. It's fun to try to bring some beauty out of these poems. And um, there are, there's so much beauty already here that I hope I'm doing anything decent to her work, uh, Elizabeth. I, I, or I should say Miss Acevedo. I have such respect for your work. It's so rich to read it out loud. So did you get a feel out of that poem? It's so small, but there's so much packed in there that might have to do with setting. Did you feel a vibe? Um, did you feel an understanding of, of Mami and her riding these trains in the early morning so she can arrive at the office by eight? Um, did, did some of her actions of where she works and what she was doing of emptying trash bins and what the poet says is being invisible how does the setting then and, and her work there contribute to what that means? Um, her hands never stopping moving, right? Fingers rubbing the material of plastic gloves like the pages of her well-worn Bible. Okay, so um, she's on the train. She's reading uh, verses, right? Getting ready for evening mass. So, right, she's, she's even staying active in this train. And you can hear our, our voice, the poet, saying... And, and as the young Ziomara saying within, take a break for a second, mommy. Okay, so I'm really noticing what the setting is like in this poem. Okay, I'm going to read you a second one, and we're going to go to a little deeper question. <clears throat> and we're going to see if you can tell me what details help you decide what the setting is like. Okay, these are fascinating, and they're a series. So the first one's called, When You're Born to Old Parents. When you're born to old parents who'd given up hope for children and then are suddenly gifted with twins, you'll be hailed a miracle, an answered prayer, a symbol of God's love. The neighbors will make the sign of the cross when they see you, thankful you were not a tumor in your mother's belly, like the whole barrio feared. Okay, consider this question. When you're born to old parents, continue. When you're born to old parents, your father will never touch rum again. He will stop hanging out at the bodega where the old men go to flirt. He will no longer play music that inspires swishing or thrusting. You will not grow up listening to the slow pull of an accordion 
or the rake of the gira. Your father will become un hombre sirio. Merengue might be your people's music, but Papi will reject anything that might sing him toward temptation. Okay, it's somewhat mysterious because it's poetry, but can you decide some details that help you understand, again, the setting and what Ziamara is taking in and what, in this case, her father is taking in as we learn about his motivations, uh, what he does now, what he used to do, and we're thinking about the title, When You're Born to Old Parents, Continued. When you're born to old parents, continued again. When you're born to old parents, your mother will engrave your name on a bracelet, the words mi hija on the other side. This will be your favorite gift. This will become a despised shackle. Your mother will take to church like a dove thrust into the sky. She was faithful before, but now she will go to mass every single day. You will be forced to go with her until your knees learn of the splinters of pews, the mustiness of incense, the way a priest's robe tries to shush silent all the echoing doubts ringing in your heart. Okay, last piece under this similar title is called The Last Word on Being Born to Old Parents. Think about this question here. How does Yamara feel about being in this setting? The last word on being born to old parents. You will learn to hate it. No one, not even your twin brother, will understand the burden you feel because of your birth. Your mother has sight for nothing but you two and God. Your father seems to be serving a penance, an oath of solitary silence. Their gazes and words are heavy with all the things they want you to be. It is ungrateful to feel like a burden. It is ungrateful to resent my own birth. I know that twin and I are miracles. Aren't we reminded every single day? Okay, so really, as we take in a little bit about setting, you may have heard less physical descriptions than you expect. However, if we still decided that there was a place represented here, and it took on a feel, a mood, kind of like what we would call an atmosphere, then again, you're sensing what we would really call the setting. Because more technical and more interesting in developing your discussion of the setting is not just what it looked like, but really the culture and the, the feel and the vibe and maybe the history of what all comes through just when you are present there. And you can feel that a lot in what Ziamara is saying, okay? You can also see that we're learning about her at the beginning of the book. So the setting is really part of while she's growing up in. What is, what is her atmosphere in her household with her various parents? Uh, is it different when she's with mommy than when she's with papi? Okay, so the fourth question was about the influence the setting would have on the rest of the story. I hope this has given you some sense and I've shown you a few of the details I would have selected from the reading so that you could get some sense of when you're asked to do the same thing. Go ahead and look deeper than just what the setting looks like and see how if any of that look or appearance contributes to how the characters operate there or feel about being there. Think about why the author might have included a portrayal of that setting in the way that they did. And then think about finally as you're wrapping it up, what did you notice? Did you notice there was a different time period? Did you notice there was an overall mood? Did you notice that it had an influence on the characters? Okay, if you started doing those noticing acts, you're doing what we want you to do in that classroom setting, and we're turning on muscles that are gonna make reading far more interesting and satisfying for you at home. I hope this has been a little revelation about all that setting could provide, and you're starting to get a really cool sense of the Poet X and Elizabeth Acevedo's award-winning book. Thanks again for being with us this morning. I'm signing out. This has been Chris Odom with KCPS Homeroom. Come on back for another ELA Tuesday. I chose manual because it's challenging and fun and it can help me with college.
I chose manual because I wanted to get a jump start in my career with culinary arts. I chose manual to acquire skills I'd use in real life. I chose manual because I want to be an ER doctor and being an EMT is my first step. Kickstart your future today at Manual Career and Technical Center. Manual is open for all 11th and 12th grade students in both Kansas and Missouri. Learn more today at enrollkc.org slash manual or call 816-418-5200. Good morning, Kansas City. Welcome to another episode of KCPS Homeroom. I'm Chris Odom, the ELA coordinator for the Kansas City Public Schools, and we're going to do another fun session today. We have a wonderful guest uh, joining us who, again, happened to be one of the students that was in one of my classes when I taught in this district, Unique Hughley, uh, a fantastic poet, artist, uh, musician, all kinds of things that exude from this man. Um, and I had the fortune of working with him way back in the early days as he came in, I think, as a sophomore or as a junior. Am I right? Is there, were you, it, was, it was the end of sophomore. Yeah. Okay. And I got to be so um, humbled by his work as we grew to know him and, and really, you know, expanded on whatever we could put in front of this young poet, absorbing things, meeting artists that were kind of around the scene at the time. I did a little session a couple days ago about working with Lemon Anderson. Unique got to have that experience. Just just some really lucky things that fell into place that we were all there at the same time to do. So not only did he excel in that uh, capacity, like it was almost like just ready to run through the that, that path when some people were still just discovering what it even was. I went in on to really ambassador some young writers and and really help nurture the program grow and a lot of people wanted to do that too. So I'm excited to talk with him after a, a couple of years of not hearing much uh, because we're all doing our own thing and we're going to yeah. talk to him today and have him share some of his craft and his perspective. So um, really, really neat chance for us to and kind of invest in uh, the author that comes out after you leave high school. And this is an author that was definitely prepared in high school, you know, more than a lot of people are. So i um, really excited to see where Unique went with his craft and kind of catch an update on him. So Unique, that's the first thing we want to know. Can you give us a breakdown, an update um, of what you've been up to lately? So right now, it's just being way more personal for me, like, and I kind of really like it because like ever since the corona happened, I can't really step out and do shows and stuff, but it really did uh, transform my art into something more introspective. Like I really had to question why I did it and more right for myself. And that's been really beautiful. But right before that, I was um, on this show called The Riot Show. And I wrote a bunch of poems for uh, about Trayvon Martin with a college professor at um, the University of Northwest, I think. And uh, we went around the country and, uh, at art museums and performed those poems and he wrote he like drew like screen um, prints of them and stuff it was pretty cool fantastic that sounds like a great project and as as early as high school you had a book out there right that book's still out there yeah. what's, it, what's it called oh it's called the monkey in the grass there's some uh references to spirituality and like i saw your quote on your email to me about the restless monkey mind on the on your email side yeah. of like that's so neat because I, I i remember passing you a couple books on philosophy or something here and there um and and be really I excited the every day yeah it was i missed that book every day that was a good yeah. book it's really fun because that's like you know those are college level materials that obviously people are hungry for before they get to yeah. college right okay well um Tell me, uh, do a little something for us, if you're willing. And I think we talked about that, and you are. And we're always so appreciative of, of artists gracing us with their artwork. We know how important it is these days to, you know, appreciate each other for that. Uh, never want to just take it for granted. So when, when you say you're willing, it means a, a tremendous amount. And I'm excited to share what maybe I know 
about your work with some people who might not have seen you before. So uh, will you do that new piece for us and then we could talk about it a little bit and maybe you could go into what you were uh, thinking or what you know what you were trying to accomplish. Uh, and remember you can always leave that up to the reader because that was a lot of times the goal the poet has not to go ahead and explain their work to death, um, but it's also a cool chance that you're here with us to, as a way to kind of unpack it for a young writer of, of what you were doing. So we, we would love to hear both words. Yeah. All right, I'm going to listen. Um, I ain't never really been good at naming my poems because they always be so like, you know, ambiguous. But um, I wanted to name this one Children of the Comet. And um, before the 16th century, comets were considered to be bad omens. We're told to foretell the death of kings, conquerors, noblemen, and queens, and in dreams, screams sing from a thing so ravaged by fire that it gleams, glowing under the night sky. We were always comet to begin with. Sons of Lazarus, Phoenix spoke of urban catalyst, raised by rays, we radiate the day at the darkest hour. We walked upon a grave, paved with our ancestors' face. They'll say it's just a phase as we phase into light, leaving no trace. This is not a protest, this is a wake. Four girls' bodies swim from a lake of flames, leaving only ash to remind us of their name for their souls. We swim into who I am, a nation of people whose history has always been up in flames. Do you know how to put out a class B fire? By suffocating it? Smothering it, you can't let it breathe. Strikes first, USA says, to cut off the oxygen. Oh, the irony, Officer Chavez knew this and used his knee for eight minutes and 36 seconds. And usually that's more than enough to douse a man's fire. But at that moment, he lit up the sky. A call for his mother became a battle cry as his tears ran dry. Muse of comets ascended, declaring that don't die. They multiply and magnify me in magnitudes. Our sight on. And that's all I got for that one right there. I can't hear you. You uh, you uh, blanked out. That that's wonderful. I was making sure we didn't hear any echoes because I, in the past when oh, I was yeah. doing recordings, I've had some trouble where I was like, "Dang, I should have pushed mute." But that's that's fantastic, man. And um, I can see you know some of what you found when you were in sophomore year is still with you. Like it seems like you still have a similar drive and passion, but you also still kind of have that that pattern. Um, has, not not to say that it's mimicking yourself over and over, but you seem to have kind of dug in and found a style. Um, can you tell me, like, how has that grown or changed since you were in high school? Um, that's that's complicated. Like, I don't know. I always like you know we had arguments at the beginning of like when I first got there because I only wanted to like rap, and uh, it took me a while to really start writing poetry. So I feel like it always been with me, but. If it just being like like my life, like I want to create a balance between like I see like rapping as something that's like it's more between simplicity, like it's a minimalism and like I can't find a, the word like I would call it like maximalism, like a lot and a little and trying to find that balance between it. And, I, and that's really been my goal to try to incorporate to not be either either, but just be in the middle of both like rap and poetry. Yeah, that's really cool. That I might even throw the word metaphysical out there, like um, to be in between, like these spiritual mm -hmm. and physical reality. And then there's something in between there that, that you're right, like philosophy exists there. I think music exists there, like really good improvisational stuff that you're like, how did they find this groove? Like where did it fall out of the sky? Mm -hmm. You know, like, that's the kind of stuff yeah. I've been I've been doing more than honestly more than writing is because I can do that in my basement without anybody there also, but but having a group and doing that with a group of people, it's fantastic with like that riffing and that that I have to do that uh, to stay aware that there's that part of me, you know, and uh, so it's pretty right. exciting. I I can tell that part of you is live and kicking, man. I'm I'm excited. Um, how do how do you keep your art drive with day to day life? Like, how's that mix? And is your is your day to day life doing your art purely, or are you finding your you're doing day to day life to get back to doing your art? Some. Mm, I always try to tell myself that everything I do is like just building my art. Like everything I take in, I wanted to be to become part of my art. Make sure I'm always learning. Make sure there's always something to like push me forward. Yeah, that's fun. I, I find that when I haven't played music with my guys over here, 
the first couple songs were basically trying to talk about we did all of what we just did to get back here to do this yeah. to go back out there and necessarily do some of the things kind of a sacrifice and so i'm getting closer to kind of wishing they were the same dang thing you know like how and that's right. a, that's a neat blend that that artists um get to live by is is man wouldn't it be still kind of back there in a looming dream of mine to uh not be sitting doing digital things on the computer, but instead on the keyboard or with, you know, something else that made yeah. some beats and some noises, you know? So uh, that's really fun. And even in my age, I'm going to keep it rolling. So I, what advice do you give maybe uh, some young people who are not going to burn out and give up and have tried it for a while, but sustain a career as, as an artist? What, what do you think they should do? Man, I, I could talk like hours about like that. Like that really like gets my, my blood flowing. But if I had to really like um, dim it down, it would be that like just make sure you're doing it for yourself. Like if it makes you happy, that really, really truly matters more than anything. Like and, if, and that's honestly like my best advice. Just make sure it's making you happy. Like just keep doing it regardless of what, what, it, what comes from it or how much you make from it. Just make sure that if it makes you happy, just keep on doing it. I think that's, I think that's the best thing we could hear young people. Uh, uh, that that's what drives it after all the years. It's what drives it, you know, later in your life. It's what continues to drive it. And the artists we love and watch who still have that awareness, you know, that that's, that's what's kept them going for sure. Not just the money or the anything else. So well, thank you, Unique. It's been really fun catching up with you in this way. I thank you so much for doing this, man. All right, bet. <laughs> All right. See you, man. You have a nice night. You too. The desire to create lives within each of us. From Grammy-winning producers and musicians, to NBA stars, to Navy admirals and Medal of Honor recipients, to internationally renowned artists and beloved local muralists, Paseo graduates have been creating their own success, their own history, their own legacy since 1920s. Kindergarten is great at Kansas City Public Schools. I know this, they have really good teachers. Uh, I know this is great school. They teach them stuff that I thought my kids would never be able to know at the age of five. Since deciding to send our kiddos to a neighborhood school, we've become a, even more of a part of our community. Now is the time to enroll your future kindergartner for the new school year. Visit EnrollKC.org today.